Well, good morning, LCM. Good morning. Today's date is July 28, 2024. And we could not be more proud to be part of a family of believers that hunger for the heart of God and do not give way to pause, slack, or slumber. You are men and women who not only hear the voice of God, but you hear the call that comes from his voice to advance. You have no ear for the sound of retreat, do you? We do not retract from the charge to perform out there what we practice in here due to the fire of heaven that is shut up in our bones. Our appetite is for more. More is what drives us on to display in full view the transformational fire of God that causes sinners to become saints, goats to become sheep, and cowards to become courageous. In doing so, we stay on mission, growing as we are being filled with and carried along by the very Spirit of God. This is how we maintain our heading while drifting in the Spirit, whether it be in the safe harbor of Fair Havens or a shipwreck on the Isle of Malta. It is by His Spirit that we fulfill our God-given purpose, shaking off the venomous attachments of our past and pressing on to preach the true gospel, the full gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Who can say amen to that? Well, do you guys fully rely and place your lives upon the counsel of God's Word? Well, the counsel of God's Word testifies to the agreement and working of His Spirit and His Word. So ranging from Genesis 1-2 to Revelation 22-17, the Spirit and the Word of God is present to do many things. First and foremost, it's there to confront chaos to bring right order and display God's light of life. What this does is that it leads all of creation to the state of displaying his glory. And the chief recipient is being mankind. In fact, it's when the, within the heart of mankind that a war rages on. And darkness desires to snuff out the flame and breath of God that fills them. The spirit and the word are always at work always at work to crush the chaos and breathe new life into what God forms from the dust of the earth, and that being you. You were fashioned in the womb for a very specific purpose. Fashioned in the womb to walk in your function on earth. That function can only be carried out by the supernatural empowerment of our God. The divine enablement to go beyond the mere and miry state of human abilities and cure the ailment that has plagued all men at all times, in all cultures, and in all languages. This being the ailment of never enough. You know, those thoughts that run through your mind that you're never enough? that no matter what you do, it's just not going to be enough? That when you hear the most encouraging of sermons, what you hear is you're not doing enough? Turn with us to Haggai chapter 2. And say there as you are turning there. I don't want you to say never enough because you say that enough already internally. Haggai 2 and verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. So in case you're missing it, God is speaking through the prophet Haggai and he's going to shake everything. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill This house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now you know that most directly in the literal passage here, this house is the house of Israel. There's no confusion for us here at LCM that this house that he's speaking of is the nation, is the family, is the house of Israel. He goes on to say, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. 
The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Do you hear how many times God is evoking his own name as the Lord of hosts, the warrior king, the one who is in charge of the armies of heaven? Do you hear that in, as in what we were reading? I also want to tell you that this is a prophetic word for this house of LCM. I don't just mean today. I'm trying to remind you of things that have been said to this house before. That this house will be filled with glory, says Yahweh Savaot. You heard it come out in the prophetic words. The men and the women who were speaking earlier during the worship service do not have our notes, do not know what we are going to say, but God does, and he's speaking to us in a resounding kind of way. His provision is there. The gold is his. The silver is his. The latter glory of LCM shall be greater than the former. So here's how you deal with prophecy in the Word of God. You first start off and you understand what it's saying to the people who, were it's, who it was speaking to. You understand that this is first for the nation of Israel, and you cannot skip that step. You have to have a deep appreciation, understanding, and a longing to see that happen for them so that it will also happen to us. Because God has given this word to this house, and let us get to it. The latter glory of LCM will be greater than the former. That's an amazing encouragement. It's the God who in Isaiah declares the end from the beginning. He doesn't just know the end. He declares it. He has said what this house is going to be. Do you know the difficulty of knowing that great things are ahead of you? That you as an individual can focus on the fact that you don't feel like you're enough for the latter days and the latter glory of this house to be far better than the former. You weren't here when it was founded. We've just sent brothers and their families to Romania to live in an area, joining with our brother who is in Italy, that they can do great and mighty works. That's awesome, but what about me, you might be thinking. Oh, I believe that God will do it for LCM if I just talk about it as an entity, but what about the men and the women in this room? We're going to go up, and the way that we're going to go up is we are going to conquer the never enough kind of mentality that's in our hearts. Husbands who don't feel like you're enough to be able to lead your family. Why do you think you were brought here? Why do you think you've been included in this family? It's so that you are more than enough because of what Christ is doing. Maverick, I want to tell you that God has brought you here because he has already made you more than enough, and you're going to come in to be able to see that day by day, my brother. I'm telling you, you're going to be the kind of husband, the kind of leader, the kind of father, the kind of man of God that we're going to be looking up to in the days ahead. I can guarantee it. I can guarantee that when I look at some of you wives who always feel like you're never enough to get it really right, Man, I've got an amazing husband, but I'm not sure that I can follow in the same kind of way. I don't feel like I'm parenting with the kind of perfection that I want. Never enough is what's going on in your heart. Come on now, is anybody with me? I want to tell you that this is the right word for this house. Today, we are going to crush this never enough kind of attitude. I want to tell you that pastors and elders are not excluded from this discussion. The strongest amongst us in this room are looking at it and said, we just launched families into Europe. We are launching families toward this yellow region on this map that God has already said. We are going to launch 100 families. That's great. We love it. That's why you're here. It's because you're inspired by it. But you've got to be more than just inspired by it. You have to overcome the never enough attitude in your own heart. Well, I just, I'm going to be around it. Pastor Matt's amazing. I'm just going to be around him. No. The glory of this latter house will be greater than the former house. Do you know what that means you have to wrestle with? 
your part in that. And that's where that never enough can reverberate. I see young men battling with their own fears and their insecurities. I see old men like me dealing with those same fears and insecurities. I want to tell you that this is going to be conquered in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up and do this because the Word of God declares it. So we're going to believe what the Word of God says no matter what you feel like. We're going to silence these lies, these demonic thoughts that plague every one of us, but you're going to overcome them, and we're going to start to overcome them today. Can somebody say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Our God is faithful and good. He always gives us the solution way ahead of us recognizing the problem. In giving that solution, he reveals the true condition of our heart, not for the case of condemnation, but for the purpose of strength and growth and rising to the full potential by which he formed you from the dust. Who has the breath of God at work in them right now? As you have the breath of God at work within you, his ruach that's giving life, realize that every time you inhale and exhale, it is a physical representation that God is sustaining your life. How can we say that there's never enough? I haven't done the math or done the research in Google of how many breaths an average human being takes per day, but I know it far exceeds our ability to really keep track of it. So then how much more is the breath of God keeping us alive in every area that we have? All you got to do is breathe. Well, let's all turn to Judges chapter 6. We're going to pick up in verse 11. Engage with us in this text. We will build on the familiarities that you have with it, but we want to exemplify some things that you probably haven't seen before. Verse 11, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite. While his son Gideon was threshing wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord, that is Yahweh, is with you, O mighty man of valor. What's happening in this moment? You have a man who is being called and summoned by God to rise up for a very specific intent and purpose that is not just for him alone, but it's for the entire nation of Israel. He is hiding in a wine press to thresh wheat because of fear. Another way to put it is that he feels like he doesn't have enough to stand up in courage. The first thing that God says to him when confronting him in his cowering of fear is, Yahweh is with you. I'm here. I'm by your side. I'm presenting myself before you. And then there's a prophetic life-giving speech that's given when he says, Gibor Chayil, O mighty man of valor. What has the Lord spoken to you? What has the Lord addressed at your lowest and weakest point? He's addressed the very prophetic, life-giving vision of what you are and are going to grow into be. Have there been those moments, internally or internally and externally, where you have layered upon layered cloaking of your own fear? You're hiding, hiding from the call of God, hiding from the confrontation, hiding maybe even from the confrontation of of the own state of your the soil of your heart while projecting some level of confidence that God looks right through like fig leaves in the garden. The whole point is that God is calling what is not present as it is. He's calling it into life. He's calling it into being. This is how the Spirit of God develops a man. He looks at the man and looks well beyond the insufficiencies because he is the God of all sufficiency. Speaking to that heart of a man, speaking to that heart of a woman, there is life 
There is power. There is purpose within you, and I'm going to summon it forth. Let's look at verse 13. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. You know, feelings, feelings are never enough. And they're seen in our questions, which are really guised as excuses. So, Lord, when, when you said that I am the man of God that you have called me to be, to lead my home, to walk in this mezuzah, carry this family banner, uh, can you tell me exactly how it's going to be carried out? I mean, give me the detailed steps. Show me exactly the plan that you have well in advance before I ever have to take the first step in it. Recount to me the deeds of how you did it for all the men of old. But Lord, don't you also see that there's all of these impediments, all these obstacles, all these enemies within me and external of me? All in all, it's an accusation against God's character. You're condemning him to make yourself able to continue to honor your own feelings above his character. See, feelings are a wonderful servant, and they're a horrible master. Feelings have to be subjugated, ruled over by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. If left unchecked, they are volatile. They're volatile in such a way that they can flame up as a fire and begin to consume all of your confidence and take that inner devilish thought of that you're never enough and begin to turn it outward and say, they are never enough. Ultimately, you're saying, God, you are never enough. Well, that's the clinching with the darkness. But what we long for, what we await for, is God to step into our darkness and say, let there be light. Let there be the fire of your presence that illuminates the desert, that guides us on our way, that puts that flame within our soul and allows us to stand with confidence and walk out of Egypt with heads held high. Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14 says, And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel. Thanks, no pressure there. Save Israel from the hand of Midian. Did I not send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Excuse, excuse, excuse. Behold, my clan is the weakest Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. I'm never enough. Don't you know that, Lord? Can you hear this interaction that's going back and forth between the Lord and Gideon? That the angel of the Lord is speaking on behalf of Adonai himself. And this conversation goes back and forth. And doesn't it sound like the conversations that we have with the Lord? You get encouragement. You're reminded of who you really are. You're brought back to the original things that God said. That he's reaffirmed. That he said again and again to you. Remember that he started this process by hearing that the Lord is with you. And then prophetic speech that told him what he really is beyond what his eyes could see. You're a mighty man of valor. He says, the angel of the Lord, the Lord says to him, and go in this might of yours. Doesn't that sound like a difficult thing? If we're honest with it. Hey, go, LCM, in the might that you have. Keith, go in the might that you have and help your family. Eric Treister, go and rise up in the might that you have. Save your people. Didn't I send you to do that? Are you feeling that? See, what happens is, is that this might that he's talking about is the koak, is the divine ability, is the power that he's already given unto Gideon. It's already the power that resides within you, the teachings that he's already given you, the equipping that he's already done. He's saying you have more than enough. My divine power has given you everything you need for life and godliness. It's not that it will give you what you need. 
Of course he will continue, but not in the way that we think. You already have what you need. We don't need better teachings. We need better men to be obedient to the teachings that we've already received. To actually rise up in faith and get past ourselves and move on and say, it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter what Wade Sutherland looks like. You know what I'm going to do? He said for me to do something, so I'll do it. If I fall flat on my face, good. At least you know that it was bigger than me. I already knew that. There was no question in my mind. I knew that before I stepped forward. Are you going to come and join me? Are you going to come and join us? Well, the task is too big. Welcome to the world of actual real Christianity. To do what? To save all Israel. This is the introduction of Gideon. This is like day one on the job, bro. Hi. I know you're scared and you're threshing weed in a wine press because you're afraid of everybody. You're a coward. But God says, I'm going to make you into a conqueror. Just come with me. Go do what I said. But I don't know if I can. You'll know it after you do it. If you're waiting to know it before you go do it, you miss every time. You will never actually see his power being made manifest in you because you're trying to operate in your power while saying you're waiting on his. I promise you, you're not waiting on his power. Step forward, husbands. Step forward, wives. Quit giving way to the demonic lies that you're never enough. God, they'd be better if I just... They'd just be better. They'd just be better without me. That's not what God says to Gideon, and it's not what he's saying to you. Those are lies. It's all about the fear of not being enough. That's what keeps us... Why do you do well on one day and terrible on another? I mean, internally. Because we're like Gideon. We have the cowardice that's in there, and we can also be conquerors. And that's what God has already ordained. He's already said it. When I look at the Reusors, I can see what God has called them to be. I can see it, whether they can see it or not. And they're starting to see it, and I love it. See, our fear has to be reserved for God and God alone. You have to be fear virgins. You have to be fear virgins. You can't just give your fear to everything and everybody that comes around. It is reserved for only one. Verse 16, and the Lord said to him, and I will be with you. I'm going to say it again. I will be with you, and you will strike. You shall strike the Midians, many nights as one man. As one man. The hundreds of thousands of people that you're facing, I'm going to let you treat them like one knockout punch, and you're going to get them all at one time. Come on now. So God reaffirms the purpose and the promise to be with Gideon. Isn't that what God did for us today during worship? Didn't he say that exact thing to us? Gideon is having his own heart come alive to the promises and purposes of God. He's going to need the reassurance as he moves forward many times. Can somebody say amen to needing the reassurance of God? We want you to know today that as you're attempting to do what is righteous and right, you've got to know that you're going to make mistakes. You're just going to have to get over that. The problem with the mistakes are that it makes you feel like you're never enough lies were true. When you make the mistake, you're like, see, I told you I wasn't enough. I have verifiable proof. Shut up. Do you really want to win this argument? Really? Really? You want to litigate that? If you win that argument, you lose everything. No, I'm really never enough. Let me show you. I'm really never enough. Let me behave poorly. Let me self-sabotage myself because I'm just... Don't win that argument. You're going to make mistakes. Or I say, I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. I have made a lot of mistakes. Come on now. You know that's true. And yet we're here. And yet God is saying I'm with you. Because you're still here, you know that he's not done with you yet. 
as a matter of fact, every time you think that, you should hear the prophetic voice that goes on in this house and realize that he's more encouraging. He's saying, I'm with you. He's calling you a mighty warrior, even though you feel like you're the smallest of child and you can't, smallest of children and you can't do anything. You're going to make mistakes, but you can never stop to make the effort to do what is holy and right and righteous, no matter what it looks like. Just moving forward is what God is demanding of us. Faith is actionable steps of obedience. It's trust-grounded obedience. Look, just to stay on that point about mistakes, when you really stand in a place of confidence with your God, and you are secure as a son, secure as a daughter, then the possibility of making mistakes no longer imprison your ability to act in trust-grounded obedience. And when you're set free from that prison, you know what that means? You never fail to try. Look, I'm not looking or seeking to be devious and wicked. I'm seeking to do what is righteous before the Lord and according to what His Word says. And I will not fail to attempt to do so. And in in attempting to do so, I'm probably not going to get it perfectly. But I'm going to pursue his perfection, knowing that I will be perfected as I'm obedient. Let's look at verse 19 of Judges 6. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put into a basket and the broth he put into a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. Now get this. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished or Holocaust from his sight. See, in this act of obedience, with no predetermined information, data, or plan of what was going to happen when he brought the offering, there's something supernatural that happened. Something supernatural that exceeded what he could naturally do on his own. It's another attestation to God's favor, koach, and direction that he was given him. Fire sprang up from the rock. See, whenever you begin to act in obedience and place your offering on the rock who is Christ, you need to expect fire. Fire of God to spring up from him who is the rock that we built our lives upon. And as you act in obedience, that fire will rise inside of you. It will consume the sacrifice that you have brought in obedience And it will be a display of his supernatural power. Well, let's tie in something here. For the past couple of weeks, we have been heavily focused and thereby heavily doing the acts of obedience of being outward focused. Who here has made a concerted and wholehearted effort to be outward focused for the past two weeks? Well, if you haven't, there will be a solution for you today as well. For those of you that did raise your hand, Did you get it perfectly every time? Was an entire nation saved in a day because of your single effort? Did you present to the Lord all you had and then experience the fire of God spring up from the rock who is Christ when you did? Then why do we wake up the next morning and expect the same thing to not happen again? Why do we doubt that he can't do that miraculous, supernatural endowment of power again and again and again? And what's our responsibility? To bring the offering. See, Gideon was attempting righteousness. He was practicing it like 1 John 3, 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. See, putting forth your your feet in faith 
to be outward focused, to look for that one life in front of you, to get outside of the myopic world that you, you dwell in, you begin to find that you are practicing righteousness, experiencing his righteousness, and be able to completely stand right before your God where he looks at you and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. So remember, Gideon didn't understand at that time that he was offering sacrifices to the angel of the Lord. While the Bible doesn't specifically state what Gideon was thinking, you can see that by the fact that his offering was accepted by fire, that his intentions were right. The result is that the fire rose up, consumed the offering, and then having completed his mission, the angel returns back to his dwelling place with the Lord. Any, anybody ever been worried about what you did being correct or not? I mean, I'm talking about like an offering unto the Lord, like a genuine did God come and correct you? Did he, if, he, if, he want, if you didn't do it well, he'll come and correct you. He's not going to leave you guessing. That's cruel. You will see that he accepted you by the fact that that offering was burned up and it went before him as a sweet-smelling incense. Look at what Gideon does, verse 22. Then Gideon perceived, he saw, that he was the, that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Ah! That's, that's my translation. Alas. Oh, Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. I'm in trouble. But the Lord said to him, man, chill, shalom, peace be to you. Do not fear. You're not going to die. <laughs> we all have that kid, for those of us who are parents, that likes to overreact. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. You literally just stubbed your toe. Stop. It'll be all right. As pastors, we know that we got some people in here that overreact. Oh, my God, I'm going to die. No, you're not. Calm down. Let the shalom, let the peace of God be upon you. Stop being afraid. You're not going to die. Quite the contrary, you're going to grow and you're going to thrive. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is Shalom. The Lord got me in right order with him and with man. To this day it stands in Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizarites. Hey, do you see again how Gideon is attempting righteousness, but he's not even doing it perfectly? He doesn't even realize he's talking to the angel of the Lord this whole time. Until when? The fire and then the angel's gone. Oh, it was an angel. Yeah, man. You've been talking to him for a while. See, he's not perfect in his pursuit, but he's just wholehearted in his pursuit. You and I aren't going to be perfect, but you know what we can be? You know what is in your power to do? To be wholehearted. His response was to get to work doing more tasks. What does Gideon do in verse 24? He builds an altar. Because he knows that he is, he is realizing he's coming awake, he's coming alive to it, and so he builds an altar unto the Lord. And God responds to this by giving more direction in the very next verse. That night, the Lord said to him, take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that, is, that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold here, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the asher that you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So question is, is Gideon acting in obedience? Some pause there. Yes, he's acting in obedience. Is it perfect obedience? No. He's making a sacrifice by night because of the fear of his own family and the men of the town. So he's gone through the process of pulling down altars, cutting down idols, building up an altar, offering a seven-year-old bull on an altar where the fire is stoked by the destruction of idols. Realize that, that God never asks for a sacrifice that is just random or haphazard. 
He's asking for a, a bull that is how many years old? Seven. Just so happens to coincide with the number of years that Israel has been in rebellion and, uh, and idolatry. And so, therefore, he's saying, I want a sacrifice that brings to the forefront and an end of the idolatry that's been going on in the land. What, what then he does that is right, we do things in teams, he takes his brothers. Still imperfect because he's doing it in the shadows of the night. But here's the whole point. He's still moving forward. God's going to help this Gibor Hayil in this midst of obedience while still not perfect and bring him to the fullness of walking in the fullness of his call. You know how God's going to help him to walk in the fullness of his call? He's going to make sure that Gideon never escapes the consequences of what he's doing. Both the blessing and the consequences. Look at the next uh, verse 28. Next verse, when the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah pole beside it was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. See, God was going to make sure that Gideon learned the lesson, the same lesson that we need to learn, that facing the consequences of your mistakes is actually having the courage to confront your own condition so that you can keep moving forward and keep building what God has for you. He did it at night so he wouldn't be seen, and you know what happened? It didn't matter. Everybody figured it out. Wasn't even difficult. They searched and inquired, bam, it's Gideon. I was trying to be sneaky. I was trying not to tell people, bam, oh, that must be him. Look at verse 30. And then the men of the town said to Joash, Joash, who is Gideon's father, bring out your son that he may die, for he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash, the father of Gideon, who had altars to other gods in his own home, Joash said to all who stood against him, are you going to fight for your own God now? Are you going to save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. If he's so upset, let him deal with it. There is a revival that begins to take place in Gideon's father because Gideon was standing up and God was helping him to be the mighty warrior that God had already proclaimed that he was. There was motion that had to take place. There were men that came with Gideon. They did what God said imperfectly, but they were moving forward, and God caused a catalyst to happen in Gideon's father's life. Let Baal fight his own battle. Man, this, this is from a guy who was facilitating it to now a guy who's defending righteous actions. Therefore, verse 32, on that day Gideon was called Jerub Baal. Jerubbabel. <laughs> that is to say, let Baal contend against him because Gideon broke down his altar. You guys get this? Gideon gets a name change here. He's identified as the one who is fighting against foreign gods now. From Gideon to I'm going to fight whoever's before me, even if it's an idolatrous, godlike thing. That is needed as we continue to move forward. Now, all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together. And they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. Wow. Clothed him. And he sounded the trumpet. And the Abizarites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. So like before, God met Gideon's obedience with empowerment from on high so that he could continue fulfilling God's purposes for his people. This call is what gathered the 32,000 men that was whittled down to 300. 
32,000 whittled down to 300. But look how this started. All right, so he goes and makes a sacrifice in the middle of the night. God exposes it. Everybody in the town knows it anyway. It inspires or ignites a fire inside of his father who was an idolater, turns his own father from idolatry, and now begins to breathe life and inspire or ignite a fire in an entire nation. Men begin to rise up and walk in their God-given identity. There was originally spoken to Gideon, Yahweh is with you, mighty man of valor. Now he's surrounded by 32,000 more mighty men of valor. See, when God begins to ignite a fire inside of you, he begins to then use that fire to turn the idolatry of your family heritage. That then becomes a marker and a monument that begins to turn the heart of every man, woman, and child that you come in contact with. Why are we here? Why is God destined our rear ends to be sitting in these seats? It's because he has united us as a family of believers that are walking in the fullness of our call as one complete army of God on earth to advance his kingdom that expands into the heavens. That's a mouthful, but let's put it down practically. This means that day in and day out, you wake up, put your feet on the floor, and you are already determined that your God is with you. You are already determined that your God is with us and that in him, we always have enough. In him, we always have enough. The right words at the right time spoken to the right people. You know those moments, probably been experiencing recently, where you are dry and you are weary? Dry and weary, almost there is a clash of metal to metal. There's no unity of oil that's flowing between the gears. That refreshment of his spirit, that unity that's among us, it's there to allow us to overcome every insecurity that we or the people that are right on our, our left and right are not enough. What happens when other men begin to be chosen and walking in that supernatural ability? Do you begin to feel overlooked? insecure, sullen, and be, or be outward focused with your own flame of fire? Or do you reckon yourself dead unto your pride, dead unto your own ambition, and you want to see 32,000 men rise up alongside of you? You want to see them advance in battle. You want to see victories in each other's households. Because ultimately they're God's victories and you get to participate in some shape or form with them in that victory. Well, when there's the removal of idolatry and self-infused strength, you know how it can really start with us on a personal aspect? Let's all turn to Psalm 139. We'll pick up in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous or idolatrous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. See, when we have the confidence to approach our God and ask that very first question in verse 23, search me, O God, you know what that means? He's going to search you. Let's just own up to it. He's going to search you, and he's going to find something, but you know where it ends? He's going to lead you in the way of everlasting. You know, there can be moments in, in your day where it seems like you just make every effort but not get anything right. Everything you touch breaks. Every conversation is conflict. No matter what comes out of your mouth or just the countenance on your face, it's just not good enough. So what happens? I don't know. You may take a drive to the store or find a secluded area in your house. Maybe run in just 
take a shower to get away from it all. And as you do, you begin to just cry out. And I, I, don't, I don't mean the, the cry out of, Oh, sovereign Lord, merciful and true, blessed be your name, have mercy upon me. Yeah, the emphasis is on the cry like, Lord, I, I'm wrong all the time. I never get anything right. I am never enough. I never do good enough. No one is ever pleased with me. You can do it so much that other people in the house can hear you doing that. And you know what the Lord is so faithful to do? Give you a sharp rebuke for putting on a party hat for your own pity and inviting everybody else into it. <laughs> Look, it's good to be true and honest and transparent with your God. And as you do, let your heart gravitate to the faithfulness of his character that he will search, that he will test your anxious thoughts, that he will be there to remove your grievous and idolatrous ways because he's looking to establish firmly your steps of obedience is the way of everlasting. Then what does the way of everlasting actually mean? It means that the deeds that are done out of your obedience, though it might include mistakes and imperfections, it results in deeds that are written in a book that lasts for an eternity. Yeah. Written in a book that gives glory to the Lamb that was slain. Look, our deeds are always being recorded. What kind of deeds do you want to be inscribed in the Lamb's book of life? Because there will be one day where it'll all be opened up and it'll all be read. What we really did and even the secrets of our own heart will be revealed. So why not walk in transparency now? You want to be liberated from your gloom and doom of your own personal failures? Step into the light of his presence and just own up to it. And when you begin to, you know what you find? The light of life begin to fill you. You begin to hear the counsel that's been given you the whole time that cures your ailment of that you're never enough. And you begin to find that you are fully satisfied by his presence, that his word does come alive, that your ears can hear from God. In fact, your hands and feet can be used on his behalf to advance his kingdom. That means your hands being laid on others to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's right. That means your words cutting through the callous hearts of other people and watching them cry out, what must we do to be saved? How about this? Maybe even the fire of God is a flame in your eyes as it is in his, and when you meet somebody face to face, they can't help but stare at his countenance that is your countenance. Do you guys realize that when Gideon made the call, how many people did he gather there? 32,000. That's 100 times more than he needed. <laughs> That's more than 100 times of what he needed that God had to whittle it back down to just 1%. Less than 1% of what he found. Do you know what most of our fears try to convince us of? Is that you don't have enough, but you have 100 times more than you need, and usually God is trying to whittle it down so you don't get glory in your own strength. He's trying to keep you from relying on your own ability too much. He's like, you got too much. You got too much going on. Let's sim simmer down now. I want you to know that it's me because if I let you with the fullness of what you can actually do, you'll think it's about you. What? Isn't that a strange way to start thinking about what God has actually given you? A unique way, but it's actually what happened with Gideon. He had too much. His problem wasn't that he didn't have enough. A hundred times more than he needed. Come on now. Look, we're going to go to Psalm 24 together. As you can tell, we have little scripted and a lot to say. Because this is where we are as a church. We're family. We're not paid performers. I'd be broke. <laughs> we're terrible at it then, apparently. But if you're family, you speak to them to make sure that they're hearing what's going on in your heart because we know what's going on in your heart. Look, Psalm 24, 
we've heard and we've studied many beautiful things about this in the past. Psalm 22 is about the suffering king. Psalm 23 is about the shepherding king. Psalm 24 is about a superior king. I want to give you a slide here that will help you maybe get a different perspective on some of the things. This is from the Bible Knowledge Commentary on Psalm 24 as a whole. They said, in preparation for the entry of the great king of glory, the psalmist stated that those with clean hands and pure hearts may ascend to his holy place. Many think that this psalm was written for the occasion of David's taking the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. You know, the one where the, when he was attempting to do that, they didn't do it in the right manner, and Uzzah put his hand on the Ark and died. In other words, that David was trying to do something noble, but did it in his own direction and was imperfect in how that it went. And so this psalm is the response of them bringing it back rightly into the presence of God. Look at verse 1 of Psalm 24. The earth, I'm sorry, there's a title of it that is actually in the Hebrew, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded upon the seas, and it established it upon the rivers. Just a quick note on this as we keep moving, but guess what? You need to make sure that you continually put your eyes on his character. Did you feel that during the worship today? Why are y'all repeating that frame? Because God is pleased with it when we're declaring that he reigns. You know what I was shifting that to? Instead of being in third person that he reigns, I made it second person and say, you reign. I'm talking to you. You reign over all. You reign over my situation. You have made me what I'm supposed to be. You are good. I'm thinking about your steadfast love, your faithfulness, your justice, your mercy. I am looking at you, mighty one, and it changes everything about you. This is what David is doing here in Psalm 24. Look at verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Hey, I think I just heard this given in prophetic utterance today during worship. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Do you see how God is attaching this, the heart and the hand, what is internal and what has to be external as well? That these two things are joined. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false? You know those false things like feeling like you're never enough? You don't lift your soul up to the falsity of, of thinking that you're never enough. That puts that in an idolatrous place in your life. Boy, isn't it, isn't it good for us to just be real about our own hearts? Do you know when something has become idolatrous in your heart? When no amount of encouragement can get you to think differently. When no amount of proof that God has been with you, you still worried about your finances? Has he ever let you down? I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen his seed begging for bread. You're still worried about that? Why? Because that may be an idol in your life because no amount of finances fixes it. He's been with you. He speaks to you. He speaks through you time and time again. You can hear from God. You can get a prophetic word. Then why are you afraid every time on the front end of, an, of a, a situation that you're not going to hear from him? Are you hearing me, David Bonham? Amen. He's been with me. He's led me. But today he's going to fail you? Terrible modern worship song. He's never failed me yet. That's just poor English. That's, you're, you're, that's dumb. What you mean is he hasn't failed me up to this point, and he never will is what you should be saying. He's never failed me yet. And he won't. Because I know his character. And those who continue to walk forward, you know what it gives you? A clean hand and a pure heart. Because you're not lifting up your soul to another and you're not swearing deceitfully, I swear that I'm never enough. I promise you that. Let me convince you that I'm never enough. Let me talk to you enough where you think that I'm... Don't swear deceitfully. You know why? Because when you have clean hands and a pure heart, you receive not only blessing from the Lord. Oh, you can't stop him from doing that, but we're not going to get off into just looking for the blessing. We want the righteousness that comes from God. You get blessing and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such 
is the generation, the people group of those who actually seek him. Do we have anybody in this house that's seeking the Lord? Are you seeking the face of the God of Israel, the God of Jacob? Anybody? Then what you can count on is that the blessing and the righteousness of God is there for you. He gives you clean hands. He gives you a pure heart. And you are able to walk in everything that he does. Why? For the purpose of ushering in the king. The passage goes on to say, lift up your heads, O gates. If this is David bringing the ark back in, what is he saying? Come on, Jerusalem. Come on, the ark of God's presence is coming. you got to be aware. Lift up. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, like the Lord Sabaoth, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up those ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. You know what's not going to happen in your life? The king of glory is not going to come in when your head is buried. He's going to come in as you are lifting up your gates, lifting up those doors, because the king of glory, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory, and he is entering. He has already entered into your life. Now let's bring him in so that he is enthroned above all the world. We're yearning to have Jerusalem have her king. We're yearning for Israel to be victorious. And we're yearning for every believer to have their head lifted and see God, the Lord of hosts, Adonai Savaot, be enthroned over all. Is that something you desire? Are you willing to give your life to do it? Amen. We shall move on now. Exodus chapter 40. We'll pick up in verse 9. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it may become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. You shall also anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. So this is the Lord speaking to Moses. It is the beginning of the consecration and setting up of the the tabernacle. Well, starting with all the items within the the tabernacle, I want to just zero in on the utensils and the altar itself. These were the very instruments that the priests were going to interact with their hands. Now we're going back to Psalm 24. Clean hands and a pure heart. What God is always doing and looking to accomplish is to establish a priesthood that rightly represents his name. And that first starts by the priesthood themselves becoming consecrated and holy before God. This is a consecration of heart. That consecration of heart then allows you to have clean hands or redeemed, righteous, and sanctified deeds that are done on God's behalf for God's people. So therefore, with your clean hands, anoint and make holy all the tabernacle and its furnishings. With Speaking to Moses, with your clean hands, anoint and make holy the men who will serve in the tabernacle. See, God's giving charge and direction for the consecration and purification of the items that the priests would utilize in their own hands. The very next verse goes on to the men themselves who will serve as priests. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water and put on Aaron the holy garments. And you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as priest." You shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priest. And their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their their generations. I heard some of you guys uh, say something whenever we got to the word clothed, that these men were to be clothed. In the same manner that God is looking to clothe 
the giver high yields in this house, separating you for his apportioned work, for priestly service and deeds. What have you been clothed with? You've been clothed with power from on high. You've been clothed with his anointing oil. You've been clothed with the name, identity, character, and work of Christ. Therefore, what do you lack? What are you missing? Nothing. Nothing at all. Perpetual priesthood is carried out on by men with clean hands, a pure heart, and a tenacious toughness that keeps them ever moving forward in trust grounded obedience. And it takes action with bold leaps of faith. So look how God responds to these types of men and their actions. Look at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. So Moses goes from that last verse that we read. He begins to set up the, the tabernacle, and he starts in the holy place and kind of backs his way out of the tabernacle, setting up and establishing each of the parts of it, making sure that it's right because he had clean hands, and he was able and called to do so. And he established it as he's backing out. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What happens when you are a man or a woman with clean hands who's operating in a perpetual priesthood on behalf of God is you're able to rightly handle the very fire of God's presence. You're able to rightly handle the things that are needed for men to find salvation and for you to find resurrection power each and every day. You're able to handle that, and what happens is God gives his sign of approval, his empowerment, and constant direction by allowing his glory to fall right there. You can rest assured that his presence was a constant source of confidence that in him the priesthood and the people always had enough. See, the cloud of God's presence is the cure to the ailment of men's hearts, grounding them in the security found in dependency on his leading. Can somebody say he, he leads well? He leads perfectly. <laughs> it's not just good. It's perfect. That means when you, when you can see how good it is, that's awesome. When you can't see how good it is, his character hasn't changed not one bit. This is difficult. It's because you need it. Thank you, Lord, for your perfect leading. I have an abundance. Thank you, Lord, for perfect leading. I don't have enough. Thank you, Lord. Because it's actually never true that you don't have enough. Why? Because he is perfectly leading you. See, the heart of man, though, is that there's insecurity that drifts away from dependency on God. What happens is that we feel insecure, faithless, fearful, so we drift. Instead of drifting closer to Him, when we feel that way, we actually drift away from Him, going, ha, ah, I'm not sure that He will do it. I'm not sure that I can do it. And we start drifting from our dependency. And it swings us from a state kind of like what Gideon did. The truth is, is that in Judges 6... Gideon was cowardly, and he started to becoming conquering by, by Judges 7. By Judges 8, though, you see that Gideon never dealt with the real altar of his own heart. He never got past some of these things. So by Judges 8, what you see is that he begins to fall into compromise. From cowardice to conquering to then compromising, and we're going to take a look at that in just a second. Because you see this being manifest because he started to be operating in a state of pride from I can't do it to now I got this step out of my way. Which, by the way, is how fear works. <laughs> Let me tell you something. In case you didn't know. When you're fearful, you operate in a certain way. And in the one area that you're not feeling fearful, you know what you can do? Ping towards pride. I got this. Everybody back up. I got it. Don't you worry about it. I got it. Yeah, see, either state of this is not where God has for us to be. It causes us to be self-directed, looking and demanding from others the affirmation of our own choices and our own leadership. And when we don't receive it, we lash out because we feel rejected and we start to tear down rather than build up other people. Does that resonate? I know I've done it. See, that lashing out, uh, another way to say it is that what initially was the fire of God that inspired you to put cowardice underfoot, 
is now becoming a prideful source of power that you are improperly exerting on those that just don't pay you homage for your greatness. It, it really is the sign of insecurity whenever you're demanding more respect than what God has actually allowed. This is seen in, in Gideon. So he goes out, finds great victory. In chapter 8, verse 13, Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle by the ascent of Harris, and he captured a young man of Sukkoth and questioned him. And he wrote down for him the officials and the elders of Sukkoth, 77 men, and he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Ziba and Zalmunna, about whom you, you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zalmunna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are exhausted? And he took the elders of the city, and he turn, took thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them taught the men of Sukkoth the lesson. And he broke down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Now, Looking at this, there's one thing that I don't see that I, I did in the previous engagement in battle. I don't see an inquiring, a searching, and getting direction from the Lord about this. What I see is a man who is returning from victory, and he's riding high on confidence, but there's something that begins to take over. He's denied of bread denied of refreshment, and he promises that when he returns, he's going to do the very things that we just read about. So let's put it personally. Personally, whenever I, and I'm pretty sure you, whenever you stepped out in faith and done something awesome, spirit-led, fire from the rock came up and consumed your sacrifice of obedience, and there was an immense amount of confidence there. What happens whenever you return home? I mean, you pull into the driveway, you go through the door, and your wife doesn't show you this, the kind of respect that you think that you're due. You ask her to fix you a plate of food because you're exhausted from battle. But she says, uh, not right now, i got some other things to go do. Or maybe she shouldn't even, even answer at all. Do you fly into a raging firestorm that begins to faithlessly cast all kind of doubt of how she's never enough? I've done that. I've done that. Wrestling with that aspect, and it, it can go into so many different areas. I mean, definitely between brothers, brothers at, war, at work, especially if it's PG Golf. <laughs> you guys know who you are. We're pastoring you right now. You begin to have an entitlement, an entitlement of reward, of respect. And if what you desire is not immediately given to you, then more than just a three-year-old child that throws itself on the ground, holds its breath until it turns blue, kicks and screams, this is an adult version of flame-throwing your fury on other people just for the sake that they didn't give you what you felt entitled to. See, there's something very similar that parallels this passage. We don't have time to turn to and read. But you guys are familiar with in Luke 9, whenever Jesus sends his disciples ahead to Samaria, and they do not welcome them, they do not welcome him, they look to him and they say, Lord, shall we call, call, call down fire upon them? I, I just imagine, that's kind of what Jesus' face probably looked like. <sighs> He looked at them, and he rebuked them. He didn't suggest a different way of thinking. He looked at them and sharply rebuked them. Why? Because they're still insecure disciples. They took the rejection of him as the rejection of them and had God's name as no real part of this. Obviously, they didn't, they didn't know what the true heart of the Father was to accomplish in Samaria. You think Jesus wasn't a big boy and needed his disciples to want to call down fire men who just didn't receive him? No. No, not at all. 
He's been dealing with rejection most of his life. So how do you deal with rejection? How do you deal when people don't see the anointing of God flowing through you? Or if they didn't see it, don't reward you with some level of entitled servanthood. It starts in our home, guys. It really does. The number of times that I poured myself out, felt powerfully used by God, get home and become the most carnal toad in the world. I was a brute beast. I, I, I've lost count. But you know what else is true? Is that the Word and the Spirit were at work inside of me, cut my heart in that moment, allow me to stand back in confidence, repent, and learn from it. Learn from it. That's the actual goal. Yeah. If you've been rebuked, <laughs> if you've made mistakes, how about we learn from it? The Lord is gracious in helping us as we're attempting righteousness and making mistakes, but the ones that are hardest to fix are the ones that have never sought out to be corrected. Look, the, the, the whole goal of this, we're getting to something that is really important. It's going to give us direction for everything. Is that the God-given authority that we have is used to build up, not to tear down. See, in Judges 8, Gideon is looking to tear down as a means of recompense of his own entitlement. But God gave us authority to build up. It's exactly what 2 Corinthians 13 says. So how about we go to 1 Kings chapter 18? 1 Kings chapter 18. Beginning in verse 29. The pastor was mentioning Luke 9 as a reference there of disciples wanting to call down fire on other men. I wonder who they were thinking about. Oh, that's right. We're in 1 Kings 18 with Elijah. Verse 29 says, Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. These are the prophets of Baal, the 450 plus the other 400 pro uh, false prophets that were all there, frantically prophesying, trying to stir up something, but completely self-directed with no power. No response. No one answered. No one even paid attention. Verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, hey, hey, everybody, come here to me. What an anointed thing for a man to do. I'm not trying to teach you. Come here to me. Come stand at my side. So they came to him, and listen to this. He repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. What are you doing? What are we saying that when you're looking at the one life that is in front of you, as you are outward focused, what are you really doing? We're telling you, instructing you, admonishing you, encouraging you to call somebody to come stand right by your side. That's so different than handing out a little track to somebody. Here you go. That's not evangelism. The biblical kind of evangelism is to come stand right beside me, Ubang. Come learn what my life looks like. Come get in the Word with me. Come see where I'm good. Come see where I fail. Come see, just come be right beside me. And what happens is a fresh fire. The fire that's in you that is kindled there with your clean hands and your pure heart becomes to be formed in them. The point of your clean hands is so that you can lay hands on them and watch the fire fall on them. It's never just for you. That's the necessary component so that they can get what they need. So that their altar can be repaired. See, your consecration is for the sake of others who have to experience the exact same things that you have. They're going to have to experience the same supernatural transformation. They're going to walk through victories. They're going to walk through defeats. And what you're able to do is see and say, hey, the Lord is with you. 
not of your own volition, but when you see God actually bring transformation, the Lord is with you. You're a mighty man. You're a mighty warrior. I know what this looks like. Your failure doesn't deter me because I too have walked through this as well. And I know what God has done in me. I know personally what it's like to get over a fear of failure. That's why I can stand here and say God can relieve you and release you from your fear of failure. You can be a conqueror over this. You do not have to be dominated by a never enough attitude. That can end. Do you know how I know? It's because it happened to me. I am no longer dominated by that thought. I have learned how to conquer that because of who he is. And a lot of it is you just keep moving forward and you learn. Is that how you did it? You learn through the process. Learn. Learn. But there's something that is beautiful about repairing the altar of men's hearts. We're going to let you see a slide here in just a second. The word for repair is rafa. It's a verb meaning to heal or to make fresh. It describes the process of healing, being restored to health, making or made healthy, usable, fertile. Particularly one that we highlighted here, it, it indicates 1 Kings 18.30, repair, restoration of an altar. See, this was so much more than just piling some rocks or arranging stones. He was bringing forth healing to a nation. You know this because of the way that he starts when he says, come here to me. Evangelism is a call to discipleship. I'll say it again. I want everybody to learn and do this. Evangelism is a call to discipleship. That means come to my side. You want to find study in Greek? Study the word parakaleo. Look at the number of times and situations that it's used. That is how the church of the living God is built. We are a rescue shop right in front of the gates of hell. We take what other men consider as trash, and we watch God turn them into treasure. We are a house of men and women that have grown and are continuing to grow to actually look fear in the face and say, my fear is not reserved for you. My fear is reserved for him. And I don't care how imperfect that my efforts to do what is righteous is, I will not fail to actually attempt to do them. With this word, Rafa, there's something unique here as it relates to the altar. It relates to what you have experienced and therefore what you go do. You are to look for those who have a broken relationship with the living God. And you are to bring healing in that relationship. It starts by the calling to your side. Come to me. Come stand here. Let me show you. Let me take you by the right hand and lead you of how to be repaired, healed, and restored with the living God. And what you're going to do is that you're going to make fresh the fire of God on the altar of their own hearts. What are you charged to do? And have always been charged to do, but we're highlighting right here and right now. Go repair the altar of men's hearts. Go restore their relationship with the living God. Because at some point, at some time, God has revealed who He is to them. But because of their own hardened heart, their own sin, they turned they turned away from them. But God put you in front of them to bring healing. God put you in front of them to rebuild their altar that can kindle a new and living flame of God just like he's done for you. Look, does that include inviting them to church? Sure. Whenever they walk through the door, they're going to experience God's presence. And he, either they'll fall in their face or they're right out the door. That's kind of where we sit. Everything else in between, we're not satisfied with. 
But you realize that the majority of our time is spent outside these walls. That God has anointed, chose you. He is with you. He has made you the Gibor Ha'il. He has made you the anointed man and woman of God to be out there to repair the altars of men's hearts. Look, don't get frustrated and don't get dismayed every time you run into somebody that is broken. You're there to repair them. There's a lot of things I could say, but I'm thinking of a Ford right now. Fix or repair daily. <laughs> that is the Adamic call. We're here to fix. We're here to repair. We're here to restore. We're here to heal. And lo and behold, you know what happened most of the time? The very thing that God has helped you overcome that seemed like an impossibility, that you had never had enough, is going to be the very cure to their ailment that plagues them and has ruined them and broken them. Do you see why it's so important for us to get beyond never enough? If you're waiting for that feeling to completely be gone before you actually get bold, you'll never be bold. Instead of saying, I'm never enough, at some point you have to say, never again. That's enough. And you have to rise up and just move forward. And you watch him repair as you are drawn to God's side. He causes a fire to be rekindled in you as you're concerned for your fellow man as you're concerned for the people around you. Don't wait to be fixed before you move. Don't wait to be perfect before you go try. It's when you are trying that you are perfected and healed. It's as you are doing it. I want to remind you, church, your purpose was divinely imparted unto you the very first moment that his power supernaturally transformed you. The very first day that you stood and resurrected, he resurrected you from your lifeless state of sin, and it was solidified in you as he brought you to this house for your development. Your growth has been gained through the constant repetition of giving all that you have every time. But I've already given all that I have. Yes, you get the privilege of doing it again and again and again, and you are formed and fashioned for others' sake as you go about that. Your generations are secured as you live in the reality that the smallest indivisible unit in the kingdom is your family, not just you, and that you function as one to achieve what God has destined for your entire family. You're given fresh fire, seen as you display trust-grounded, daring acts that are most definitely beyond your own reach and ability, and yet you achieve the impossible every time, time and time again. In so doing, you actually glorify God, not able to receive the credit because it was beyond you anyway. Your mouths are filled with the all-supreme, abundantly sufficient Word of God that never settles for half-truths, partial convictions, or stale statements, hidden thoughts that are acceptable to most but are actually detestable to Adonai. Your heart, look at me, church, your heart is fully awakened to the centrality of Israel for God's plan and that the dependency of all of the Scripture hangs on their success and their fulfillment. And now your eyes are set toward the mission of reaching all, all the nations, all the world, all the languages, all the tribes with true discipleship that unashamedly declares all that he is to the entirety of the world. And the way that you do that is you have clean hands, a kindled fire, you rightly handle what God's doing, and you help men repair the altars of their hearts. Please stand to your feet. Pull up Jude 22. We're going to read through 25. How we do this is seen in these passages. And have mercy on those who doubt, and save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Saints, you have a charge, a charge this morning, and that is to go and repair the altar of men's hearts that are broken and ruined. They're saturated and inundated with idolatry. And through you, you take on that character of being a Jerub Baal. You are the one that is the Gibor Hayil. But let, let's highlight this. Men, raise your hands. If you're 12 years old or older, raise your hands. Men, it starts with us. Ladies, look around. God has surrounded you, ladies, with men who are mighty men of valor. You are to look to them as a source of inspirational strength and direction of how to go repair the altars of men and women's hearts. Men, as we begin to pray, I want you to lift up your soul. I want you to ask the Lord, as Psalm 139 says, search me, O Lord, and test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any idolatrous way in me. And as idolatry is crushed inside of us, men, then we know how to appropriately handle it within our homes and outside these four walls. Men, do you receive this charge to evaluate your soul before the living God? Do you receive the charge to be courageous in repairing the altar of men's hearts? Then let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the responsibility of bearing your name. Lord, we thank you for the charge to be your ambassadors out into the world. Lord, we say now, let your spirit come and invade our heart, our mind, and our soul. Lord, see if there is any grievous way inside of us. And Lord, may we lay it down at your feet. May it be burned up on the altar, O oh God, that we would have no selfishness. We would have no ambition outside of you. We would have no glory for ourselves, but instead it would be for your glory and your glory alone. Lord, may we do our deeds in your sight and our fear be reserved for you and you alone. Lord, let your fire come down and consume us, O oh God. Let it burn brightly in us and stir up our hearts in zealous fashion for the ones that are out there that need their altars repaired. In the name of Jesus, amen.